Hi gang, with the arrival of 10th edition 40k, a new fourth Tyrannic War is brewing. At the end of the third Tyrannic War, the high fleet known as Leviathan had been thought defeated in the skies above Baal when Cadia fell and the Great Rift spread across the galaxy, but as it turned out, Leviathan really was going to live up to its name. So by the early years of the 42nd millennium, a lot had changed in the grim dark future of Warhammer 40k. The Great Rift had spread across the galaxy, separating Imperium Sanctus from the lost worlds of Imperium Nihilus. The Primarch of the Ultramarines, Robut Gilliman, had returned, leading the Indomitus Crusade to shore up the Imperial defences and try and hold strategic corridors through the rift and Abaddon the Despoiler, fresh from splitting the galaxy in half, had partnered with the demonic entity Vashtor the Archiphane to reform a great key, piloting this moon-sized key into the webway in search of an ancient vault of hidden weapons, hotly pursued by the second returned Primarch, Lion L. Johnson of the Dark Angels. And all that happened in the first couple of decades of the 42,000s, which is a lot for the Imperium. But you know what hadn't changed? Bugs. Well, they'd changed a little bit, but we'll go into that. Since the first invasion of the Tyranid Hive Fleet called Behemoth back in the 700s M41, the incursions of the Great Devourer had become more and more common, and the old bedstead of the Imperium was now thoroughly riddled with them, munching away at its proverbial legs. After High Fleet Kraken was halted during the Battle of Icar 4 in 993 M41, the much larger High Fleet Leviathan started to appear, attacking from underneath the galactic plane across a much wider front and ushering in a third Tyrannic War just a few years after the second one. All of these major incursions, as well as a slew of smaller ones, had made splinter fleets and rogue bioships full of ravening biological horrors a pretty consistent threat for the Imperium. But with the dawning of the Era Indomitus and the breaking of Leviathan at Tarsis Ultra and Baal, the biggest high fleet yet encountered was thought defeated. But while the Imperium had set its sights on the more urgent threats posed by the forces of Chaos, the Indomitus Crusade, the Plague Wars, and the fight against the Arcs of Omen, Leviathan was still coming, new tendrils winding their way through the void between galaxies as they closed on ours. Like all of the previous Tyrannic Wars, the Fourth started in silence, as systems on the fringes of the Imperium dropped out of communication. In the West, across the Segmentum Tempestus, systems in the Asmodiacs and Morphium subsectors went dark astropathic communication ceasing entirely or briefly ending in a series of screams and a wave of psychic terror. In fact, the Morphium Sector Command was almost annihilated when their astropath received a panicked communication from the fringes of the region, losing control and accidentally summoning a warp horror of thrashing tentacles and massive teeth. And there were other signs. Both those sectors were under attack, but Orc fleets would suddenly redirect themselves away from the Imperial worlds, and sectors gearing up to fight off impending attacks from Votan corporate interests or Chaos Renegade warbands would find themselves facing off against nothing, their enemies suddenly gone. And then the survivors came, refugees fleeing the fringes of both sectors, picket ships, the last of their battle groups breaking warp with news of systems overrun by vast swarms of warrior organisms. But this time, the Imperium would be ready, not because their systems had improved or anything, no, this time the Imperium would be ready because the people making the reports had friends in high places. The Eyes of the Emperor are a secret order within the Adeptus Custodes. The Custodians are the personal bodyguards of the Emperor himself, mostly confined to Terra and the Segmentum Solar, but who range across the galaxy, seeking out potential threats to the Imperium. Each of them is a gene-crafted warrior created from infancy through a process that is far more advanced than the crude augmentations used to make space marines, and they can live for thousands of years, but when they start to slow, when age starts to take its toll even a bit, they have a tradition. The custodian puts aside his traditional armor and weapons and leaves the palace, venturing out into the cursed earth to bring the law to... Sorry, sorry. Venturing out into the galaxy, totally different, to keep watch for distant threats and report back to their younger brethren. 
Three Eyes of the Emperor have been in the affected sectors and raced back to Terra, broadcasting ident codes so senior that the defense officers who heard them and granted their passage through to the throne world had to be put to death afterwards. The three reported their news to Trajan Valoris, Captain General of the Adeptus Custodes, who, as a High Lord of Terra, strong-armed the rest of the High Lords into actually taking the threat seriously. And one of the people who took it very seriously was the Lord Commander Solar, Leontus, who was, to be honest, a bit embarrassed about missing the whole Second Siege of Terra thing a few decades back because his model hadn't been invented yet and wanted to show willing, I guess. This meant that rather than the hurried response to the previous three invasions, led by locally stationed space marine chapters or the forces of the Inquisition, this new threat was to be met by the entire military and industrial complex of the Imperium. Leontus ordered massed mobilizations of the Astra Militarum, new regiments raised and existing ones redeployed as Imperial High Command analyzed the pattern of silence spreading through the void. Two new tendrils of Leviathan have made inroads into the galaxy. The first, Prometheor, was pushing up through the underside of the galactic plane just like during the last war, though much further west, assaulting the Morphium sector and the Cassidor Gulf. But the second, named Nautilon, was coming from the opposite direction, from above the galactic plane, pushing down through the Asmodiacs and Vinor sectors before both tendrils turned east running parallel to each other towards the Segmentum Solar. This wasn't the first time Terra had been threatened like this. Some of the tendrils of Leviathan from the previous war had been heading that way before they were redirected, and the Sector had suffered smaller attacks by High Fleet Scylla and Charybdis, as well as a brief Gene Stealer uprising on Terra itself, but it was enough to spur the High Lords into action. The wheels of Imperial bureaucracy started to turn. PDFs of planets in the path of the Swarm were ordered to muster Departmento Munitorum Armory Worlds ramped up production or released munitions and supplies from their vaults, while embattled systems fought desperate last stands to slow the two tendrils. But this would all take time. The Imperial Guard does not move quickly, and so, in the interim, Valoris and Leontus propose the formation of strike forces known as Soul Blades. Formed from the elite of the Imperium, these would be small forces that could take the fight to the Tyranids, harrying and delaying the two tendrils while the Astra Militarum swung ponderously into action. Sometimes only a few ships in number, Soul Blades were formed from Space Marine companies, questing night houses, Adeptus Mechanicus explorator ships dispatched from Mars, and often missions of the Sisters of Battle. The Convent Prioress on Terra dispatched forces from the orders of the Ebon Chalice, Sacred Rose and Argent Shroud into the dark. These were often led by famed commanders. Kayvan Shrike of the Raven Guard commanded a Soul Blade, while the Ultramarines dispatched Soul Blades from the far eastern fringe under the command of First Captain Agemon, a veteran of the First Tyranique War. And even Trajan Valoris and his custodians led fleets as they departed Terra amongst a ton of Imperial pomp and propaganda. The Soul Blades fell on the two tendrils as they continued their path east. The swarm had dispersed a bit as it pushed into the galaxy, splinter tendrils pausing to feed on conquered worlds, and the Soul Blades conducted a hit and run war, falling on these tendrils as they ate, destroying rogue bioships in the void, or reinforcing the defenses of vulnerable worlds. But there was a little confusion. The Imperial Fists deployed to effectively hold the Latora system against the oncoming tide, but Soul Blades led by the Sons of Medusa came across such strong resistance that they contented themselves with rescuing just the Magi and Tech Relics from the Forge Worlds they'd attempted to save. And when Soul Blades led by House Terran and the Silver Skulls chapter found that their attack on the Tyranids was assisted by Eldari forces, their zeal for the destruction of the Xenos got the better of them and they turned this hit and run conflict into a protracted three-way campaign. But while the Soul Blades took the fight to the slowing Nautilon and Prometheor tendrils, the High Command of the Astra Militarum were busy preparing the defenses. Leontus and his vast strategic staff had divined the path of the two tendrils and designated a series of anchor worlds, planets in the path with formidable defenses that, anticipating the shadow in the warp, lay on reliable warp routes for resupply. These worlds would act as bulwarks against the swarm and supply bases for further Soul Blades, and the most important of them was to be Sanctum, in the Formidar system of the Bastior Sector. 
Okay, look, there's going to be a lot of these silly names in this. The current 40k policy of having copyrightable names means that we can't just have Nautilus. We have to have like Nautiliax or Formida or, you know, the fortress planet of Defense Otron and everything ends up sounding like a He-Man character. You asked for it, Clawful. Meet Fisto. Anyway, Sanctum was the home planet of the White Templars chapter and already had formidable defenses, though much of the chapter were away fighting with the Indomitus fleets. Leontus transferred his vast command staff there aboard the Phalanx, Fortress Monastery of the Imperial Fists, and the skies of the system were filled with naval assets as millions of Imperial Guard deployed to the Fortress Monastery and bastions across its surface. Across the Segmentum Tempestus, a ring of defences sprang up, and way out from the Anchor Worlds, the two tendrils started to slow under the constant efforts of the Soul Blades. Things seemed to be going well for the Imperium, and we all know how that usually works out. Systems started to fall silent on the edge of Bastior. The alarm was raised by a task force of the Indomitus Crusade fleet Sextus that had been patrolling nearby and had been retasked as part of the defense forces. A tendril had been missed, lost in the confusion, its advanced elements assumed to be parts of the other two. As Nautilon and Prometheor converged and pushed in from the west, a third tendril of Leviathan, probably the biggest so far, had pushed in from beneath the galactic plane, heading directly for the largest concentration of Imperial forces, as if it had been waiting for this moment. All the Tyranids just learned to read a map and guess based on the name. Bypassing the Soul Blades, this Grendelus tendril had already overrun the Mozart cluster and the Rendor belt and consumed loads of tasty, tasty squats in the Votan held Unhart stars and was fast surrounding the outer Bastior sector. But Leontis and his staff had, to a degree, planned for this. They enacted the Sanctuary Protocol. Broadcasts went out for aid from nearby Anchor Worlds as all forces in the Bastior Sector pulled back to the three central systems of Castile, Pyamot, and Formidar, the only ones as yet unaffected by the Shadow in the Warp. Stalag, Kald, and Iron Tower were cut off, their defenders consigned to hold in the face of the oncoming tide, pulling back from the Orc raids they were initially defending against and trusting the Hive fleets to take care of the problem for them. The Votan mining colonies in the St. Catherine's Tears asteroid belt fortified themselves against bioship incursions as, on the verdant worlds of the Palat system, Imperial authorities were reminded why the system had been placed under quarantine millennia before as Necrons awoke from their slumber and Eldar hosts descended on the Tyranid invaders, unleashing ancient superweapons. Elsewhere, the civilians panicked. On distant Gallowspire, the clergy refused to believe that the Emperor would allow Xenos this close to their world and declared any claims to the contrary heretical, even as the Astra Militarum defenders received their orders, pointed their guns skyward and manned their fortifications. The factionalism between the two sides soon devolved into violence as the clergy denounced the actions of the military and the Ministorum continued to declare the invasion a heretical conspiracy that didn't exist, even as the spores were falling from the sky and the Tyranids swept across the surface, weakening the Imperial defense even further. So next time someone tells you there's no satire left in Warhammer. Anyway, the Tyranid fleets kept coming. As more and more side tendrils of Grendelus entered the system, so did more Imperial reinforcements arrive in response to the Sanctuary Protocol. Stalagide was overwhelmed by 11 waves of hive ships, their ground forces led by a giant hive tyran wielding four bone swords. Who could that be? Pyamo came under attack from both the Tyranids and the Orcs, led by a creature called the Monster Boss, and Castile was assaulted. Eight waves breaking on the naval blockade of the system before new Tyranid ships emerged from the deeps. Dubbed Mind Flayers, they spread discord and paranoia amongst the fleet and deployed new bioforms onto the surface, psychic beasties that spread a wave of hallucinations and terror ahead of them. But at Formidaire, any waves were impossible to discern, the attack was relentless. On some worlds, the Hive fleet was so thick that it could be seen from the surface. Hundreds of fronts broke out across the system, from void battles at Fractam and Lembic to gene seal occult uprisings on Jovengast. Fleets of bioorganisms slowly overwhelmed the star forts of the system and then pushed their way through the asteroid field of the Dawn's Wall on their way to Sanctum itself. 
They were resisted in the void by the Imperial Fists fleet led by the Phalanx and the remains of the Indomitus Task Force, but once routes had been cleared through the asteroids, what had been an incremental, ponderous advance suddenly sped up as bioships threw themselves at the defenders and disgorged billions of organisms to the surface. The initial assault spread across the whole planet. Imperial forces fighting a war of maneuver with Tyranid swarms through forests, harbors, and plains. Legio Destructor walked, dueling giant bio titans, but as the Hive Fleet landed more and more Xenos, the defenders were forced back into the fortresses that studded the planet. The biggest assault would be in the heights of Artorus, centered on the Holdfast, the fortress monastery of the White Templars and Leontus's headquarters. Besieged, with waves of Tyranids being cut down as they rush the walls, Lord Commander Solar Leontus walks the ramparts with his train of strategic and support staff, rallying the troops while coordinating the defense, while the White Templar's chapter master, Stavro, led task forces of his veterans against infiltrating Trigons and Morlocks in the depths of his fortress. But while the hive mind continued to send waves of constructs at the walls, it also deployed infiltrators to try and take the base from within. Three Norn emissaries attempted access. One squished itself into a lift shaft and emerged in one of the highest command points of the fortress, attacking and destroying the monitoring equipment there. One emerged from the tunnels under the monastery, opposed by a score of White Templar's dreadnoughts stationed there and eventually killed by Chapter Master Stavro, but the third climbed one of the peaks that overlooked the monastery and lay in wait. When Leontus' command train emerged into a high courtyard, it struck, plunging down into the aides and strategos and scattering lifeguard and veterans, knocking Leontus from his robo-horse. But before it could kill the Imperial commander, gunfire pinned it in place as an Adeptus Custodes gunship circled the courtyard, golden figures deploying from it, led by Trajan Valoris. Finally managing to disengage from the initial two tendrils, the Soul Blades have received the Sanctuary summons and returned, fighting their way through a dark warp and massing together into bigger and bigger fleets during the journey. Forces from the Raven Guard, Black Templars and Blood Angels broke sieges in the Castile system, and a fleet comprised of Soul Blades from a dozen chapters attacked the monster boss in Pyamote. Valoris and his custodies had led Soul Blades in a charge directly towards Formidaire, linking up with Tor Garadon on the Phalanx on the way and breaking through the swarms of bioships just in time to save the Lord Commander Solar. As Soul Blades continued to pour into the system, Sanctum was saved, and the Tyranid invasion of the system stalled, but the same was repeating on hundreds of worlds across the segmentum. Anchor worlds assailed by new tendrils of Leviathan, remote planets lost to the darkness, and a new wave of chittering griblies munching their way ever closer to terror. And then back in Bastior, while engaged in cleanup operations, a ship of the Raven Guard made the first sighting of a strange moon sized object. Too big to be a simple bioship, but obviously Tyranid in design, heading directly for Sanctum. The fourth Tyrannic War had only just begun. And there we go, that's the fourth Tyrannic War, or at least as much as we know of it. It leaves us on a cliffhanger, but that was the same with the previous editions of the game. When the second edition Tyranid Codex came out in the mid-90s, it detailed an invasion of Hive Fleet Behemoth, but the invasion of Hive Fleet Krakum was still undecided, and the final battle of Icar IV was actually decided through a massive worldwide campaign. And then in later editions, the story of Hive Fleet Kraken was filled out, but the new threat was Leviathan, and that was added to over multiple editions. The final big battle of the Third Tyrannic War, the devastation of Baal, was only concluded pretty recently. So I think we can expect the same to happen with the Fourth Tyrannic War. Maybe I'll need to make another part of this video in a year or two. But for now, that sets us up for the 10th edition of Warhammer 40k, and that's everything we know. Thanks for watching. And if you'd like to hear more about the events of Warhammer 40k, then click on the little link to the right there. You can also join the Patreon or the Discord for early access to videos and the ability to vote on the videos. And if you want to buy me a gribbly hoard of my own, there's some links to affiliate stores in the thing below. See ya.